Good evening. Thank you for having me. And like Jessica said, my name is Dr. Devanya Bonami Lee. I have a clinical doctorate in physical therapy. I'm a certified lymphedema therapist recognized through the Lymphology Association of North America. And I'm a US board clinically uh, trained women's health clinical specialist. So that's kind of a mouthful. But we're going to be talking about physical therapy management of lymphedema. And first, we're going to talk about the lymphatic system in detail so that you have a better understanding of what we're talking about. And then we'll head into the management. OK, so we'll get started. The reason why I chose this topic also is because I empathize quite a great deal with people who are going through this process. Sometimes uh, after a cancer diagnosis, followed by treatment, followed by everything else that goes along with it, when you also get a diagnosis of lymphedema, it can be you know, a little bit hard to take considering that you have such a long road to travel. So the more that people understand what's happening with their bodies, the better able they are to make uh, educated decisions. So this is where we start tonight. The lymphatic system really is your body's way of getting rid of waste products, right? That's kind of the simple way of putting it. But the lymphatic system works in coordination with the cardiovascular system. These are the two main transport systems uh, for fluid moving throughout your body. If you think about it, the cardiovascular system has the heart mechanism, and that pumps blood, rich in oxygen and protein. It pumps blood throughout the entire body, right? And then it brings that blood back through the veins and then dumps it back in to start all over again. The lymphatic system is similar in that you have fluid moving throughout your body, but there's no heart, right? There's no heart associated. There's no metronome to say that this is how it's going to be moving. So once the blood is moved from the heart into the extremities, through the arteries, and then the uh, capillaries, 90% of that blood then comes back through the veins and then is dumped back into the heart again. Now 10% of that actually is then filtered through. There's a filtration process that then leaves this byproduct called lymph, which flows into the interstitium and kind of ends up in the tissues. And it's, this is where the lymphatic system kind of starts this whole process. So that 10% is really filled with proteins, uh, waste products, cellular debris, toxins, kind of the yucky stuff that your body doesn't really want back in it. It's, 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 his body way of, it's our body's way of getting rid of the waste products. The lymphatic system at that point, through the lymphatic vessels, such as lymphatic capillaries, then reabsorb this fluid. And then it goes through larger ducts called the collector vessels. And these collector vessels have valves that move the fluid through the body toward the heart. Sort of an exchange in that there's no heart, but there are valves that are helping this fluid to move along. After these collector, uh, these collector vessels, then it goes into lymphatic trunks, which are much bigger vessels. And that goes right back up towards the top of the neck. And just before it gets the top of the neck to be put back into the bloodstream, it also goes through another filtration process, which is seen through the lymph nodes. Now, lymph nodes are things that people are usually familiar with, right? So your lymph nodes are sort of the be all end all when it comes to filtration. They also provide more white blood cells and help your body get rid of these products. So in understanding the lymphatic system and that it's really your body's way of moving fluid to get rid of waste products, it works in conjunction with the cardiovascular system. Okay, and that's sort of like an oversimplified version of it. But let's talk about the lymph nodes. So whenever you go to the doctor, you know the doctor will palpate certain parts of your body. For example, at the base of the, the, base of the skull right by your jaw. So if everyone can just hold on just underneath here, you know where the doctor holds on just, just below the ears, above the jaw. They're looking for those lymph nodes to see if they're swollen, right? Your lymph nodes are indicators of there's something else going on in terms of your immune response. And if there's a lot of swelling, it's also another indicator to your body to send even a, a more stronger, I guess, or a stronger immune reaction to ensure that those waste products are being filtered out of the body. So your lymph nodes are in clusters at the neck. They're also in the armpit area, which is called the axillary region. Right? They're also in the mediastinal area, middle of the body here. They're in the abdomen, and you can see those little bean-like structures in the image here. But they're also in the groin. You have about 600 to 700 lymph nodes in your body in total. About 300 of them alone are in the head and neck region. Uh, approximately 40 are in the armpit or axillary region, and you can have between 9 and 12 in the inguinal or groin area. Right? So, not everyone's born with the same amount of lymph nodes. 
but they're distributed similarly. I hope that part was very clear. Everyone understand that part? So lymph nodes are very important. They're indicators for the body. The lymphatic system is your body's way of getting rid of waste products. And this is kind of where the story begins. All right, so now you have an understanding of the lymphatic system. Let's move on. There are different types of lymphedema. So before we get into different types of lymphedema, you understand that lymph is this protein-rich fluid which has a lot of waste products in it that your body's trying to get rid of. When you have an accumulation of this fluid, that's called swelling or edema. So lymphedema is the swelling or accumulation of this lymph byproduct. Right, so it's an abnormal swelling because your body should be able to regulate the fluid movement. Just like it does with your heart and blood, it should be able to regulate how much of this fluid is moving throughout your body. So primary lymphedema is very rare. Uh, happens one in every 6,000 people uh, based on the UK reference here. But primary lymphedema is specific to that it's congenital, genetic, right? It happens as a result of that network of lymph that you saw, the lymphatic system that you saw in the picture before with the green lines going through. All of those, all of those uh, vessels really kind of connect in a way that's intentional. When you're born with a genetic, I want to say mal malformation really, it interferes with the movement of the lymph fluid. And as a result, your body can't reuptake, it can't reabsorb, it can't distribute the fluid properly. And as a result, you have the swelling, um, as you see in the picture below. Uh, this is a young child here. But you can also have, you can also, uh, have lymphedema manifest itself during puberty as well, typically in females. Um, but also older adults may also have lymphedema much later on in life for different reasons that we'll go through a little bit later. Secondary lymphedema is much more common and it's also something that people are more familiar with as a result of cancer treatment. But the main cause of secondary lymphedema worldwide is actually the result of a mosquito-borne parasite called filaria. And filariasis is that associated uh, infection that causes lymphedema. So that's actually in tropical countries in Southeast Asia where you're going to see more of this type of secondary lymphedema. However, as it pertains to breast cancer, two in every 10 women are likely to get lymphedema. Five in 10 women with vulvar cancer likely get lymphedema. And three in every 10 men with penile cancer are likely to get lymphedema based on this reference here. But secondary lymphedema can also be the result of injury, trauma, infection, and cancer treatment. So let's talk a little bit about why cancer treatment specifically is causing secondary lymphedema. Let's just say you are diagnosed with breast cancer, for example, and you have this tumor that's in your body. It's going to be treated. Your oncologist is going to take a second look at it. And they're saying, well, let's see what's happening. That blockage or that tumor may be creating a block, either in the meshwork of the lymphatic system or directly at the lymph nodes, and it's preventing the lymphatic system from being able to do its job. Right? Secondly, um, Let's just say they want to look further into the tumor and say, is there metastases? Is there cancer spreading? What they might do is a sentinel lymph node biopsy, where they'll take a look at the first three lymph nodes that are draining the breast tissue or draining that area of the body. And they'll assess one, two, three lymph nodes to see if there's any spread of the cancer. If there's no spread of the cancer, then those are all the three lymph nodes they'll take out. In that event, if you've only had three lymph nodes removed, but you have 40 lymph nodes in that region, the risk of getting lymphedema is pretty low. Right, makes sense? Fewer lymph nodes removed, very low risk because you have lymph nodes left to help remove the fluid that needs to be removed or redistributed. However, if after they've taken out those three lymph nodes and they've seen, wait, there is cancer in those three lymph nodes, let's take an, a closer look. And then you are recommended to have an axillary lymph node dissection where they take out even more lymph nodes if you only have 20 lymph nodes in that axillary region and they take out all 20, then your body's ability to transport the lymphatic load that's created is going to be at a disadvantage, right? And so you have this accumulation of abnormal fluid in a certain area of your body, and that's lymphedema. So just to reiterate, primary lymphedema, uh, congenital happens before the age of one. Primary lymphedema precox is any time it can manifest itself between the age of 1 to 35 years old. And then lymphedema tarda is after the age of 35, where you can still have symptoms or signs of lymphedema 
after a certain age if it's a genetic lymphedema. Secondary lymphedema can be the result of lymphatic obstruction, like we talked about with the tumor, right? Or it can be lymphatic interruption. So let's talk a little bit more about lymphatic obstruction first. When you look at malignancy, we're talking about that same tumor. So that tumor can be anywhere in your body. Right? It doesn't have to be breast cancer. It's wherever that tumor is, and it's blocking your lymphatic system and the vessels associated. Uh, radiotherapy specifically, when you have radiation to an area, you're changing the cellular structure. The anatomy is changing because you're radiating the cells. And that's not just true for the cancer cells, it's also true for your normal cells, your lymph cells, your lymph nodes, everything that, that radiation is touching is being changed. Right? And so as a result, your lymph nodes may not be as effective as they were before. Your lymphatic system may not be able to uptake. Maybe they've shrunk, maybe they've enlarged, maybe they're dysfunctional. Whatever is happening because of radiation, it's changing the way your body is regulating the fluid movement. Make sense? So as it pertains to lymphatic interruption, this one here says groin surgery. Now your pelvic lymph nodes and your groin, your inguinal lymph nodes, are actually much bigger than, for example, your head and neck lymph nodes or your armpit lymph nodes. And that's why you have fewer of them in the groin and more of them in the head and neck and more of them in the arm. So if you have groin surgery where they remove lymph nodes and you only have nine or 10 or eight of them, if they remove even two, that's a huge change in what your body's ability has been, right? So you are also likely to have genital lymphedema, lymphedema associated with that same side and I'll talk a little bit more about regional lymphedema because I think that's important for people to understand too. Lymph node excision is very much just that. If you have lymph nodes removed, they don't regenerate. They're not going to grow back. So once they're gone, they're gone. That means that your body is at a disadvantage and you're not able to regulate that fluid anymore. Okay? And that's where that accumulation comes back and your body has a disadvantage of being able to regulate that fluid. Right. So move on to the next one. But before we go there, let me just think. Yeah. So before we go into that, I just want to go back to the lymph nodes here. So lymph nodes are regional in that lymph nodes in a specific region take care of that region. If you have head and neck cancer, for example, you've had a parotectomy or you've had a laryngectomy, right, or you've had a pharyngectomy and they have to remove part of um, that part of your body or and they have to remove associated lymph nodes, the drainage associated with the head and neck are going to be controlled by the lymph nodes at the head and neck region. For the axillary lymph nodes or lymph nodes in the armpit, those lymph nodes are in control of or regulate the transport of lymph for that same side hand, the same side forearm, the same side of the arm, the same side of the upper chest on that side to the belly button and on the back to the waistline. So if you have lymph nodes removed on the right, for example, and you have radiation on the right, for example, you're only going to have lymphedema on the right. You're not going to have lymphedema on the left. You're not going to have lymphedema in your leg. Does that make sense? So it's regional and it's very specific to different regions of the body. Same thing with the groin. If you have lymph nodes removed at the inguinal lymph nodes, you can see there in the groin there. If you have those removed, you're only going to have swelling on that side, that leg, from the belly button all the way down, front and back, including genitalia. You're going to have swelling or lymphedema associated with those regional lymph nodes. So a lot of times I'll get questions about, well, I have swelling on this side, but I had surgery and radiation on this side. It's not necessarily connected. And remember, edema can be the result of many other things. You can have a cardiovascular condition. There can be some other trauma that's creating this swelling. But remember that lymphedema is associated with particularly the lymph nodes that were affected. And that's the issue really with primary lymphedema is that you don't know which part has been affected. And so you can have swelling in any part of the body, really. So you can have bilateral swelling because you may have pelvic lymph nodes that were affected or there may be fewer lymph nodes in the pelvic and inguinal area for primary lymph, lymph, lymph node removal because they were born with fewer. And so you can have swelling on both sides. Is that clear? You understand that part? OK. So let's go ahead. So there are stages to lymphedema. And understanding these stages means that you'll be better equipped to manage your lymphedema. Now, stage zero is called, is called subclinical or latent. This is the latency phase in that there's no visible changes to the arm or to the leg. This is where there's less than two centimeters difference between the extremity. 
it's not that you're not feeling any sensation. You may feel numbness or tingling. You may feel heaviness in the arm or the leg or the body part, but there's no visible sign. And when you go in for your examination, your doctor may say, well, let's look at your arms. There's no real change here, right? So you're in that subclinical stage. It doesn't mean that nothing's happening. It just means that there's, you may be in this latency phase for five years, for years, for months or years, right? Stage one is mild. This is where you'll see some changes to start. You may notice heavy, like a real heaviness in the side, or you may feel sort of tingling a sensation. But this is also where you'll notice pitting edema. Now, pitting edema is where if you press on your skin and there leaves an indentation, it's called pitting. When you see that happening, um, that means that you're in that stage one. This is reversible. When you elevate your arm or start to exercise your hand and that swelling goes away, reversible lymphedema, you're in stage one. Stage two is a little bit more intense in that it's a moderate, a little bit more swelling. Um, you may notice this time there's hardening or thickening, some fibrotic changes in the tissue itself. The skin feels harder, it's not as flexible. Um, Non-pitting edema is when you do press and there's no indentation, but you know that it's swollen, right? So this is non-pitting edema in that there's definitely swelling, but it's not creating an indentation. These are more uh, non-reversible changes. These are changes that are becoming permanent changes to your cellular structure. Stage three, which is the most severe, it's very rare because if you've gotten through all three stages, at some point you would have contacted your physician, I would hope, and then you would have gotten treatment or at least started the education process. Um, but stage three is where you have very large, very misshapen extremities. This is the one that everyone says, oh, now I know so-and-so has lymphedema, I can see it. It's really obvious. And this stage, the skin becomes very wrinkly. It's leathery. You may have papillomas, which are like flower-like projections. The skin is darkened. It's very different looking skin. And this phase is called lymphostatic elephantiasis. So the longer your fluid, this protein-rich fluid is hanging out in your limb, you're allowing for the bacteria and the waste products and the bad stuff to kind of sit there and accumulate and just sit there and become a breeding ground for infection. Right? And so as a result, your skin is responding to this. Your body's responding to this. And it's called lymphostatic because there's no movement. It's static. Elephantiasis, we'll see in a minute um, what each stage is about, really. But just so you understand, the stage is here. And the picture's just indicating, really, what I was talking about uh, regarding pitting edema. So this next picture here on the left, we're looking at breast tissue, right? This is what women are going through. This is real. The woman on the right really is going, oh, this is, yes, the woman on my right, really, uh, on her right breast tissue, it's actually an improvement to how she was when she first started. But if you can look closely, the tissue is actually hardened, it's firm, you can see an indentation, you can see where it's likely to be pitting if you pressed on it versus the, the uh, contralateral or other breast tissue. The tissue, you can tell, is just not as moving as fluidly, and she's also having some difficulty with regards to raising her arm because the skin is also tight in that area. Now this patient also had radiation therapy, she had uh, chemotherapy, and she also went through, I believe, a lumpectomy as a breast conserving strategy. Because you can have a lumpectomy to remove the tumor and then go through radiation to kill the rest of the cancer cells. And as a result, if your radiation is happening to the front, to the side, through the armpit, you're in, your whole lymphatic system is being affected. And so it's going to have a difficult time draining that fluid, getting rid of uh, the blood and the lymph. And so you end up with tissue that's just enlarged and accumulating, uh, looking a bit misshapen. The lady on the left here, this is stage three. I'm not sure if you can see the differences in the image here, but significant difference in terms of size. There are very different shapes in terms of, you can see her calf is a lot larger. It's a strange shape, and she's got a lot of bulbous uh, issues going on here. This patient came in with a fungal infection, which turned into uh, cellulitis. She was in the ICU because of poor management of lymphedema. Now, lymphedema itself is not painful. It's not fatal. But the side effects of ignoring lymphedema can create a sequela of things that can lead you to the ICU. So you want to be cognizant of the stages that you're going through. If this is something you're going through, with family or friends, have the discussion. Um, talk to the physician. Talk to your oncologist. Make, ask a few questions. You know, start making those steps because these are both preventable 
and they're also manageable. So lymphedema diagnosis is done through a series because like I said before, edema doesn't necessarily mean it's lymphedema, right? If someone has swelling in their legs, they don't all, all of a sudden have lymphedema, right? It could be something associated with congestive heart failure or chronic venous insufficiency or some other cardiovascular issue. So your physician um, really should go through a series or if they know your cancer history are able to kind of figure out what the differential diagnosis would be. And the gold standard for diagnosing lymphedema would really be the lymphocentigraphy, which is where they inject a radioactive dye and the entire lymph lymphatic system is lit up. And they can see where all those pathways and networks, how they work, how they communicate, how it all comes together. So lymph lymphocentigraphy is very difficult to locate, especially in the Bahamas, but there are a few vascular surgeons in the US that will offer this as a service if there's really, you're really not sure about what's going on. A Doppler ultrasound is used as a way to ensure that your patient doesn't have a DVT or a clot. And the CT and MRI are also helpful in distinguishing if it's something else going on with the extremity. So physical therapy referral, really, once, you, once your doctor has identified that this is lymphedema or is unsure, they may send a referral for evaluate and treat lymphedema. Right? The idea is that you're going in for education, you're going in to understand how to manage your understanding about the process, understanding about the lymphatic system. And really, it starts with phase one, which is the four to six weeks of comprehensive treatment. Now, you can be seen, depending on the severity of the lymphedema, five days a week, where you learn how to do a lot of this self-care on your own, but it takes a while to become independent with it. Manual lymphatic drainage, or self-manual lymphatic drainage, is a way to increase lymph flow, a way to be careful about what's happening with your skin, what's happening with the lymphatic system, but also encouraging drainage um, to ensure that you're having some of that fluid move so that you can also do self multi-layered bandaging. And the picture here is really of this bandaging approach in that you're using, you're using several layers of compressive bandaging, short stretch bandages, not the, atlet not the athletic uh, long stretch bandages, but very specific short stretch bandages that encourage movement with as you're being active it's encouraging this lymphatic flow at the same time and then education on prevention so really understanding that your skin is an organ and your skin is the first defense you may have while you're combating or managing lymphedema you want to make sure that your skin maintains its flexibility it maintains its elasticity so moisturize, moisturization is really critical because if you have a crack in your skin because it's dry you're letting more bacteria in which means you're going to elevate the immune response, which means your body's gonna to try to help solve the problem, pushing more fluid to the area, and your body's already at a disadvantage to move that fluid. So you can end up with more fluid accumulation just because of dry skin, right? In addition to that, you wanna make sure you're taking care of your nails, and that when you go and have a manicure, the esthetician is not cutting and making you bleed at your nails. You wanna make sure you're having them gently pushed, or you can do it yourself but be very cautious about your nail care because that's also something that's gonna be affecting you and that's for the arms and the legs. In addition to that, very hot conditions can create an inflammatory response. Uh, let's just say it's Christmas dinner and you've been in remission and there's no issues but you've had quite a few lymph nodes removed and you're making that soup or you're making that turkey or you're making that potato salad that everybody loves. I'm a little bit hungry, that's okay. But you know, you're in, this, you're, in this, you're in the kitchen. It's very warm, you're using extra muscles, you're standing for a long time, you're, getting, you're exerting yourself, you're even straining your arm for holding that, that, that spoon for a long time. You're creating a repetitive strain in your arm, you're creating an inflammatory response. Your body's reaction is to increase blood flow, right? So now you've got that blood flow coming through your body, and then that 10% that we're seeing filter out is now increased volume. That your lymphatic system now has to figure out a way to regulate distribute and somehow reabsorb. And that's just one Christmas dinner, right? Yes. So you can't exercise? That's not what I said. Sorry. So the question is, so you can't exercise. The, of course you can exercise. When it comes to remedial exercise, which is part of the physical therapy uh, intervention, exercise is all about moderation, low exertion. You shouldn't be doing heavy weights. You shouldn't be creating opportunities for injury because injury is going to lead to your body's immune response. And when you're trying to build muscle and build muscle and hypertrophy those muscles, 
I hear, it sounds like you're trying to do something fishy over there. But really you want to make sure that you're creating uh, muscle movement because it's the pressure also against the muscle behind the skin and using the lymphatic system in that way to encourage movement of the lymphatic flow. So you want to avoid overexertion, but you want to also be active. So a simple walking program is a great way to do that, right? Uh, simple walking, 30 minutes a day, getting used to activity level, but it also depends on what your body was doing before, right? If you're used to being a little bit more active, then it depends on what you were doing prior to, and then modifying that to ensure you're not creating more opportunity for injury, okay? So in addition to education on prevention, you also get a lot of education on how to manage long-term, which includes understanding compression garments, understanding the pneumatic pump if you need one, understanding um, how to obtain custom-made garments, and prophylactic garments in the event that you're in that stage one or a latent phase where you're not really showing signs, but you're very concerned about um, air travel, or you're concerned about being in a new climate, or if you're concerned about being somewhere where there's going to be lots of mosquitoes. Understanding what your risks are and how to prevent is also really important because you don't want to create new opportunities. After those four or six weeks, depending on how frequently you're coming to therapy, you can start to reduce your sessions, see how you do independently, change your garments, and make sure that you're on your way. But you don't want to step away 100% from your physical therapist. You want to make sure you have a constant dialogue and that as you go through the year, you're making sure you're taking the steps appropriate to manage the lymphedema. <coughs> Bless you. Now, contraindications to treatment, what should not be happening when you're referred to physical therapy. You should not have an acute infection. Now remember we talked about how that stasis, that stagnation of the protein-rich waste product fluid that's in your arm or in your leg or wherever it may be. If it's there for a while, you may develop cellulitis. Cellulitis is a bacterial infection, right? And you've got all those waste products hanging out there. It's, cre it's a breeding ground for bacteria and now you have a bacterial infection, which is a systemic infection. You're going to see a rash. It looks like a rash with lines in most cases. It'll be quite red, can be hot, and that can be painful as well. You may also feel as if you're getting the flu, malaise-like symptoms. Call your doctor immediately, right? Because it won't take but 48 hours for you to be incredibly ill to be taken to the hospital anyway. So you want to be started on antibiotics as soon as possible. That's not the best time to come to therapy, okay? Whatever is happening with your body with regards to infection, you take care of that first. And that includes fungal infections. Fungal infections are terrible. You don't want to start bandaging and using moisturizer and doing all these things to your skin if you have a fungal infection that's just breeding and breeding and breeding. Take care of all infections before you start physical therapy. Cardiac edema. We don't want to create more pressure by increasing the load onto the heart. Malignant disease. If you're, having, if you're in stage four or you have metastatic cancer, this may not be the best time to address in terms of uh, reducing lymphedema, but it may be the best time to manage your symptoms to ensure that you're comfortable and your quality of life is the best it can be at this stage. Renal dysfunction, also because of the fluid that's being moved around, you don't want to create more stress or strain on your kidneys. And then acute DVT, in that you've just been diagnosed with a deep vein thrombosis or clot in your leg, not the best time to start wrapping up your leg, right? You don't want to wrap up and start squeezing your leg when you have a clot in it. So these are direct contraindications to treatment. And these are things that you would, of course, be communicating with your physician. Complete decongestive therapy is what physical therapy is all about. It is the gold standard for management of lymphedema. Yes, there are different ways to treat or manage lymphedema, but it all comes back to the same components of complete decongestive therapy. Now, there are different surgeries that are possible. They have a lymph a lymph node transfer that can happen or a venous anastomosis. They can try different ways, but the truth is at the end of the day, you still have to do this form of therapy to ensure that you're getting the management that you need. So in those cases tend to be quite severe and there's been a long-term management of that patient and then the cases are then looked upon by the physician and decided if it's going to be a surgical case. So we talked about before skin and nail care, education, manual lymphatic drainage, now this drainage is not a typical massage. This is a massage that creates lymphatic flow by encouraging the lymphatic vessels to open and close, open and close, open and close, because there are valves. So if you press really hard on your skin, you're then closing the valves. 
So if you have a Swedish massage, or if you have a deep pressure massage, or if you go and have acupuncture, or if you have different types of treatment that create this pressure, you may be damaging vessels, or you may be reducing the effect, um, or creating more swelling rather than improving the swelling. So you want to be very careful about how you address that massage, and that you go to a certified lymphedema therapist who is experienced. Uh, Multi-layered compressive bandaging we talked about before, and then long-term management includes compression garments. Those can be 15 millimeters of mercury for prophylaxis, or it can be 20 to 30 for mild or moderate lymphedema. And then for lower extremity lymphedema, that would be more uh, 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury. And that just means the tensile strength of that flat net garment, because you want to make sure you're managing once you've gone through all the treatment. And then remedial exercises, low exertion while you're wearing the garments. A lot of times patients will say, I'm free, and they take off the garments, they take everything off, and then they go for their run, or then they go for their swim. But you have to wear the garments while you do your exercise. Not while you're swimming, but while you do your exercise. Okay, because the combination of the muscle activity in addition to the compression really create the lymphatic flow that we're looking for to help reduce the accumulation. The pneumatic compression pump is something, um, it's not controversial anymore, really. It's more, it's becoming more, mainstream, but I find that it's used more for people with severe lymphedema stage three who have very difficult time managing uh, their swelling because they can't reach their leg or they're a lot older. It becomes too labor intensive to do all of the drainage and the compression. And so the pump is a great way to manage the symptoms as you get through your day-to-day -day activities. So the treatment that I'm talking about here, and there are variations of treatment, but it's usually those same mainstay components. At the top, underneath the word treatment, you'll see that that's the multi-layered bandaging for the lower extremity. At the bottom of that picture is also uh, the compression garment, which is the same color as the patient's skin, which is used for the maintenance or long-term management. At the top corner on the right here, you'll have uh, taping. This style of taping is helpful in drainage in that it helps to lift those collector vessels and that they're allowing for better fluid movement. It's also great in tropical areas or where it's really hot because some people really can't tolerate wearing bandages. And you want to see a therapist who's very skilled at applying this type of uh, tape as well. At the bottom here you have the pneumatic pump. And then in the middle we have our medial exercise where this patient is wearing her bandages, she's going through some resistive exercise but she's also being assisted. You want to make sure that your client is able to do their entire home exercise program, including bandaging, drainage exercises, independently or with the help of a caregiver or family member, so that there is carryover. The goal is not to see the patient every day for the rest of their lives. The goal is about getting the patients to improve their quality of life, um, get them independent, and feel like they're living a life again. Right? So with that, I just want to say thank you for listening. Uh, I hope I didn't speak too quickly, but it's something that I'm very passionate about. I do enjoy talking about lymphedema. I do feel like sometimes during the process of being diagnosed with cancer, patients don't necessarily hear the word lymphedema, and so it becomes a total surprise when they have these symptoms. In addition, you may not, you may not notice signs or symptoms of lymphedema three, five years down the line. Right? It may be quite a while before you notice symptoms because of what I said. You may just be creating a new opportunity, you may be trying a new exercise program, or maybe your body just hasn't transitioned yet. And so depending on the new activity, that's when you may see it manifest itself. But there's certainly not enough research out there to tell us why after five years that's when it's showing up, but every body is different. So you may not be born with the same amount of lymph nodes as someone else, so your risk is always going to be a little bit different. So if there's any questions, uh, please let me know and thank you very much.